I had Michael begin our scripture reading at verse 5, just to sort of get us into the context of what's taking place. Remember last Sunday morning, uh, Paul has um, basically asked a rhetorical question to the Corinthians in light of all the undermining that was taking place by Judaizers and, and critics uh, there at Corinth regarding his um, letters and message and so forth. Uh, he had asked that question, do, do, do we begin again to commend ourselves? In other words, do we need recommendation again? And the understood answer to that is no. And so he says, I don't need recommendation written out. You're my letter. You're, you're the epistle uh, written in our hearts and, uh, and so forth. And so when he comes to verse 5, <clears throat> having said that he doesn't need recommendation, he is assuring them that he understands his sufficiency, the ability to conduct the ministry that God had called him to do. Uh, that ability did not lie from within. That ability was something that came from God. His sufficiency was of God. And so he was not boasting. He was simply fulfilling the ministry that God had called and empowered him to do. Now, in speaking of his ministry, I want you to look there at verse 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. We think of our Bibles as the Old Testament and the New Testament. Literally, the idea is the Old Covenant and the, and, and the New Covenant. When we think of the Old Testament, and, and, and by the way, we have 39 books of the Old Testament. And by and large, you've got this much of your Bible that's Old Testament, and you have, um, I'll lose my place there, that much that is New Testament. See, 27, 27 books, and some of them are very, very short. But, but Paul here is uh, saying uh, in, in this particular verse that he has been made a minister of the New Testament, of the New Covenant. Now, why is he going to make a point of this and begin to speak of this in the following verses? Because part of the reason he's receiving the criticism that he is is you have a whole group of people who are still steeped in the law. Judaism. And it's not that they were incorrect in everything. It was that they had not gone far enough in accepting Christ and the Messiah who came to fulfill the law. And he's saying to them and directly going against these Judaizers and these people who are motivated as, uh, by, by keeping the law, he's saying, listen, God called me to be a minister of the new covenant. The Old Testament is that of the law. The new testament, the new covenant is, is the, the testament of grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is about the keeping of the law, uh, all of the ceremonies and ordinances and so forth. The New Testament is about the fact that Jesus Christ came to fulfill that. He came as the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice. And so he begins in verse 6 and says, Who hath also, also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Now, there are those who would rip that phrase, those two little phrases, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, rip it out of the context of the passage and try to teach some contemporary, newfangled, unbiblical theology that basically says Christianity is nothing but of the heart, therefore don't worry about anything external. You can sort of do what you want to do. That is, that is not even under discussion here, okay? When he's talking about not of the letter, he's referring to the, the law. You, you could literally uh, think of the letter as the law I explained there in verse 7, written and engraven in stones. What's going on there? He's talking about when Moses went to the mount and came back with the stones that were engraved with the law of God. A lot of times we think of the Ten Commandments and so forth. And Moses didn't just go once, he had to go twice uh, because he, he broke the first ones because the children of Israel were in such sin. But when he says here, our ministries of the New Testament, not of the letter, 
It's not about the keeping of the law, but of the Spirit. Can I, can I put that another way? The New Testament is not so much about an outward performance of keeping an outward set of rules and obligations and ceremonies to, to somehow find favor with God. It is about what takes place within the heart, the Spirit of God, when a person is saved. And of course, from that, it's going to manifest itself uh, outwardly at some point, because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But under the law, people were obsessed with the minutia, keeping this, keeping that, keeping the other thing. Have I done this? Oh, no, I failed in that. Uh, um, and, and it was not so much about an inward relationship with God as much as it was about an outward compliance. Paul says that's not what the New Testament is about. It is about an inward transformation that will affect every part of a person's life, including outward, but it starts from within, you see. Verse 7, he says, but if the ministration of death, the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious. Now, what's he speaking of there? The law literally condemned a person. If you were guilty of the law in one point, you were, you were guilty of the whole thing. And you fell short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Now the law, its function was to bring us to Christ. But in giving the law, um, God is helping mankind understand his failures. His inability to live perfectly before a holy God and his need for something else. And so literally, if all a person has is the law, then they're going to continually bump against the fact that they're not perfect. They are a sinner. Um, because of their sin, they're apart from God. Their iniquities have separated between them and their God. And they're going to continually be reminded of that in their inadequacies, in their failures, in their inability to perfectly keep the law. But if you don't have something beside the law, then you're left in a hopeless condition. The Judaizers were in a hopeless condition. We've got to keep the law. Ooh, and we've got to keep it perfectly. Ooh, we have failed. Oh, no. We, 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 there's this little point of the law that we have failed in. Uh, we've, we've been inadequate in this thing. Failure, 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 ultimately resulting in death. The letter killeth. Verse 6 says, Paul says, I'm a minister of the new covenant, the gospel. It's not about death. It is about life. Verse 6 says, but the Spirit giveth life. In, in other words, it's, it's, it is the fulfillment of, it is what they needed. It's what these people who had been under the law needed. They needed Jesus Christ who fulfilled the law and could give them eternal life. Notice the other, another comparison that he gives here in verses 7 through 11. He begins to talk about the fact that the Old Testament law, or the letter, was glorious. This is, is what it says in verse 7. If the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious. Now, what, what's he referring to? He's referring to the time when the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Verse 9, for if the ministration of condemnation be glory. So, so he's talking about when the law was given, when Moses comes off the mount, his face is shining. He's been up there 40 days and 40 nights. He's been in the presence of God. And his face literally shines forth. And he has to put a veil over his face. And, and so what Paul is saying is there was a certain amount of glory, even though the, the law, the letter killeth. It's the minister of death. If that's all you have is the law, you're condemned because there's, there's no solution. But there was a glory attached to it. When Moses came down, there was a glory. Uh, he, he is, his face shone. But compare that with what Paul says regarding the New Testament. The new covenant that he's, uh, of which he is a minister. 
So, so he says, uh, verse 8, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit, this New Testament, you see, be rather glorious? In other words, it's more glorious, if you will. Verse 9, for if the ministration of common condemnation, that's the law, be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. So he makes the comparison again. Verse 10, again, for even that which was made glorious had no glory. In other words, the glory of the law, by comparison, had no glory by reason of the glory that excelleth. In other words, the glory that comes of the New Testament and the Spirit is so much more glorious than the glory of the law that it almost does away with the glory of the law. Verse 11, for if that which is done away, the law was glorious, much more that which remaineth, the things of the Spirit, being glorious. Think of it this way. A lot of times glory is referred to as, uh, we see it as light and, and things like this. Think of it as the difference between the moon and the sun. You go out at night and the moon is shining and you say, wow, look at that. Now, I don't want to get into all the science of, you know, <laughs> reflection and so forth. But just let's just take it as us going out and say, look, look, look at the moon shine tonight. And boy, it, it's, uh, that's great. But then let the sun come up. And uh, it so overpowers, you see, that that's what catches the attention. And, and Paul is simply saying here, the whatever glory was attached to the law, which, by the way, that glory faded away, but whatever glory it had was so far outdone by the glory of the new covenant. And by the way, the new covenant doesn't go away. Which then takes us to this other comparison that, that he's making here in verse 11 and 12 through 16. He says uh, that the law, for that which is done away was glorious. All right, it was a temporary glorious uh, glory. In verses 12 through 16, he's talking about the fact that Moses, verse 13, put a veil over his face, you see. Uh, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Now, what, what, what took place here, and, and I won't go into all, all the uh, specific detail of it, but he put a veil over his face. But what happened to that glory that was upon Moses' face? That glory faded away. He had been in the presence of God, and so his face was shining, and he puts the veil over because they couldn't look upon him, but that, that glory just begins... To fade away. It's done away with. It's a, it's a temporary glory. By the way, in that same thing, he then begins to refer to the fact that uh, these Judaizers and those who were under the law had a veil, spiritual veil, over, o over them as well. Their, their minds are blinded. Um, it says in verse 14, the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Verse 15, even unto this day when Moses read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And I want you to notice the word it in verse 16. That's not referring to the, the children of Israel. Otherwise, it would say when they, when they turn to the Lord. What the it's referring to is the heart of the end of verse, six, uh, verse 15. Never, nevertheless, when their heart shall turn to the Lord. When it, the heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. But the glory of the Old Covenant is temporary. The, the glory of the New Covenant, the New Testament, is a glory that remains. That's what it says in verse 11. Much more that which remaineth is glorious. So Paul says, I am a minister. He's addressing head on these Judaizing critics that he has who are under the law, who do not understand that Christ came and fulfilled the law, and now the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need to accept Christ as their Messiah. And he's saying, listen, that Old Testament, that Old Covenant that they're under, it's, it's, a, it's a very temporary glory. And, and, and literally, it is something that will ultimately kill them. Because all it's going to do is point out how much of a sinner they are. The only hope is in Christ, but they don't accept that. He's saying, that's not what my ministry is about. 
My ministry is not about keeping people under the old covenant. My ministry is about the gospel of Jesus Christ and his transforming work through the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of people. Now, I gave us that lengthy background to try to help us understand the passage as Paul speaks of his ministry. But I don't want to leave it there this morning because in Paul's description of this ministry that he has, there are three things that he clearly says are true of this ministry of the new covenant of the Spirit. Three things that should be true in the life of any Christian who is Spirit-controlled, remembering that here in this New Testament age, when we get saved, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God immediately takes up residence within us. Body is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. We are immediately baptized by the Spirit, placed into the body of Christ. The only thing commanded of Christians regarding the Holy Spirit in relation to that type of thing is to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And that happens anytime a Christian yields and surrenders their rights, their plans, their agenda, confessing their sin, keeping a clean slate, and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide, lead, and control them. If that is taking place, then there are three things that ought to be evident in, in the life of a Christian. And somebody says, well, Pastor, how do I know if the Holy Spirit of God is controlling me, if I am being filled by the Holy Spirit of God? Well, let me tell you what it won't be. It won't be the so-called speaking in tongues. Okay? That which passes for that today does not even resemble what took place in the Bible. Okay? That has ceased for this time. Um, there's a lot of things that it won't be, but let's see what Paul says would be, would be evidence of a, of a ministry or a life that is allowing the Holy Spirit to control them. There's three things that ought to be true in the Spirit-controlled life. And so if a person says, I want to know if I'm Holy Spirit-controlled, Holy Spirit-filled, all right, see if these three things are true of your life. The first one's in verse 6. The letter killeth, but the Spirit, the Spirit giveth life. You say, well, I thought you were talking about the Holy Spirit. Yes, verse 17 picks up the phrase, picks it up, the thought again. Now the Lord is that spirit. The first thing that ought to be true, if one is testing to see if they are Holy Spirit controlled, filled, the Holy Spirit controlled life ought to be characterized by life. The Spirit giveth life. Now what do we mean by that? Those who were following the letter of the law, those who were living under the old covenant, were mostly concerned not about what was taking place internally, but what was taking place externally. Their life was consumed by rules and checklists and commandments and ordinances and minutia and details. Am I doing this right? Am I doing that right? And a person who is living a life that is largely outward only, Outward obsessed. Will be leading a life that spends a lot of time trying to look good to other people. In, in, in other words, am I, am I putting on the right act? Am I putting on the right appearance? What does that person think of me? What is that person? Am I, am I doing what that person would expect? Am I meeting their expectations so that they consider me a good Christian? And it becomes an obsession with external things, trying to look good. In other words, pleasing man. It very much leads to this outward, this outward life leads to a dependence on checklist Christianity. 
In other words, over the years, godly people who were living with a heart for God, very much in keeping with the fact that they, their Heavenly Father is a holy God and says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Taking such principles as avoiding all appearance of evil. And things like this and taking, okay, we, we have developed certain things and, and, and so a Christian who's living for God should do this, shouldn't do that, should do this, shouldn't do that. Now that stuff doesn't necessarily come about for the wrong reasons. Good godly people who are being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God seeking to live in accordance with what a holy God, their heavenly Father, would want develop such things. Today they're loosely called standards or whatever. But here's the easiest thing in the world to do. To lose the heart behind those standards and just live according to the standards. The standards aren't wrong. But if the heart's not behind the standards, we've missed the boat. Now, there's a whole generation today that wants to say, ah, yeah, legalism, legalism, legalism. Well, a heart, if a person has a heart behind the standard, it's not legalism. Secondly, legalism is trying to keep a list of rules to get saved. Okay? So there's a basic misunderstanding of the word legalism. But let's just set that whole thing aside anyway. That's a group of people who really are trying to have it both ways. You see, good things are developed oftentimes by good people who have a heart for God and, 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 and they love God and they understand He's a holy God and they understand that they ought to reflect well on Him and they take the Bible truth and in, in time spent before God, they, they say, God, I don't think this particular activity would be pleasing to you. And, and, and I think this particular thing would be something that would be pleasing to you that you would want me to do based upon um, uh, your word and, and the things I know about you. And, and so over a course of time, there's a, a whole list of things that they will do or won't do or whatever, but it's being driven by their time with God and their heart for God and their love for God. But then somebody else comes along and says, wow, what a great Christian. And they don't necessarily see the heart. All they see are the external results that are coming from the heart. And so over time what happens is it gets reduced to if you will do these things, then you're a good Christian. And somewhere along the way, the spirit and his work in the heart gets left behind. It's not that these things are wrong. It's that those things ought to be the outcome of a heart for God. And by the way, those in this day who would say, just have a heart, don't worry about all of this stuff. Hey, wait just a second. If I have a heart for God, there will be an outflow of that. But... When we get to a dependence on checklist Christianity where we say it just becomes a thing of, okay, uh, if you're a good Christian, if I'm going to be a good Christian, if I'm going to look good to everybody else, and uh, let's see, what do I have to do, okay? Uh, read my Bible. Do that. Check. Pray. Check. Go to church. Check. You know, give. Check. Hand somebody a track. Check. Tell somebody about Jesus, check. And it just becomes a checklist Christianity. And what happens is a person spends all their time and energy trying to look good, but the heart of all of this isn't there, and they're just drying up and shriveling away internally. And when that happens, when all of the external is not being driven by internal, when it's just an external thing, then literally, inwardly, we shrivel up. We are absolutely wasting away spiritually, and we just grow weary and tired of the whole thing. It becomes a burden. 
It becomes a duty. I've got to do this to fulfill the checklist to be a good Christian. The Apostle Paul is saying, listen, the Holy Spirit of God is what ought to be driving all this. When you have a Holy Spirit-controlled life, it literally results in life from within. What, what did, what did uh, Jesus say there to the Samaritan um, woman? He, he said in John 4, 14, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up in everlasting life. And that's really the picture of the Holy Spirit controlled Christian life. It is a life that is absolutely manifested with all kinds of external declarations that I love God, am serving God, and am trying to be obedient to God. But it's all being driven by a Holy Spirit control a relationship with God internally. And as a well of water springing up from within, it starts from within and works its way out. Folks, you can't work in from out. You can't go from outside in. That's not, if somebody says, well, I'm going to try to get the internal taken care of by doing all the right externals. It doesn't work that way. Get the heart for God. Get surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Develop in that fellowship with God and as a well of water springing up into everlasting life, what's internal will overflow. And so a Holy Spirit-controlled life is manifested as life. It's just not an, a, an external checklist. It's not just a duty. It's not, i got to do this. No, it's a heart that's in love with God. And from that, all these other things come forth. But they're not seen as duty. They're not seen as drudgery. They're seen as one living a life that's in love with God. Now, right, here's the second thing, second test that one can apply to see if they're living the Holy Spirit controlled life given to us very clearly in the passage, verse 17. Now, the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Oh, again, folks, that phrase, that verse has been so taken out of context, so misapplied. For this, for a generation of people who want to have one foot in the world and one foot in spirituality, for a generation that wants to be thought of as a dynamite Christian and yet indulge themselves in all their carnal desires, They'll come to a verse like this and say, freedom in Christ, liberty in Christ. Oh, I have freedom to do all these things. And what they're really getting at, by and large, is they want to give themselves cover to engage and indulge in carnality. No, folks, when it says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. There's the freedom to accept the grace of God. You see, these Judaizers were under bondage. They were the, under the bondage of the law. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this. I got to do that. But they had not been free to live for God. To, to, to move forward. And folks, when we get saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes and He lives within. And as children of God, the Holy Spirit gives us the freedom to accept the grace of God and to move forward in living the Christian life. This idea of, I've got to keep this rule, I've got to keep this rule, I've got to keep this rule, I've got to keep this rule. A checklist mentality is a, it, it, that's not an advanced Christianity. That's, in, in, in fact, that is a sort of a superficial Christianity. Now, one may say, oh, but if, if one has enough things on their checklist, that's really spiritual. No, it just means they have a lot of rules. Not against a long list of rules, as long as those are emanating from a heart for God. You, you see. 
But, but there, the, the shallow Christianity that's just about the external and, and a person hasn't accepted the grace of God and felt the freedom, I'm no longer under the law. Paul's saying to these Judaizers, hey, you're under bondage. You're never going to be able to move forward for God because from day to day it's, did I keep that rule right? 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 He says, I'm a minister of the grace of God. The fact that I can't keep everything right. And without Jesus, I'll die in my sin and I'll go to hell. But there was a day on the road to Damascus that I met Jesus and I made him my Messiah and my hope and trust is in him and I have experienced his grace and no longer is it about, did I keep that right? Did I keep that right? Did I keep that right? It's about God. I love you. And developing a fellowship and intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit of God uh, to, uh, to, to manifest himself in and through me and moving forward. In fellowship with God. He has the freedom to do that because he's not having to say, did I, did I do that one right? Did I do that? Now look, obedience is very much a part of the Christian life. But again, it's the overflow of what's going on inside. If, if, if what's going on inside is right, if the Holy Spirit is having control, then I'm going to want to obey God and serve God. Liberty is not a license to sin. It is a freedom to serve Christ. So the second test is, have I experienced the freedom to move forward in following Christ? Or am I still getting caught up in trying to do the outward things to please people? To, to try to feel good about my situation, to try to somehow make, take the external and make, through the external, make the internal right. That's backwards. It's the internal that affects the external. All right, here's the third test, verse 18. But we all, as with open face. Now, what's he talking about? He'd been talking about the veil over Moses' face. But he's saying we all, with open face, there's no veil over our face. Because remember in verse 16, when their hearts would turn to the Lord, the veil should be taken away. But we all with open face, unveiled face, beholding as in a glass, like a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Literally the word changed has the idea of transfigured or transformed. Here's the third test. A person who is living the spirit-controlled life, it'll be characterized by growth. Growth in Christ. Verse 18 is talking about the whole process of sanctification. The minute we're saved, we are declared holy saints. When we get to heaven, we will be holy. But between our salvation and getting to heaven, there is the process of sanctification where we are being transformed into the image of Christ. And so the picture here in verse 18 is of this person beholding their face in a glass in a mirror and literally they're looking less like themselves and more like Christ. And a little bit more, you know, a little bit more, or shall I say a little bit more less? That's not right. Anyway, uh, not, not looking like themselves and, and, and looking more like Christ, and it begins to change. Just a little bit, 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 and over time, one's looking more like Christ than they are their old fleshly picture. That's growth. Change from glory to glory, from glory to glory. How's that being done? By the Spirit of the Lord. Do you realize if a person's not growing, they're not being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God? One cannot grow in their Christian life without the Holy Spirit's help and enablement. All right, now let's back this up. Somebody says, okay, how do I know if I'm, if, if I'm living the Spirit-controlled life? All right, first of all, if you are, then it says the Spirit giveth life. 
And this is that well of water springing up from within. This is not just an external thing that you're doing. This is from within to without. The second thing we saw is, is where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. One is not under the yoke of the law or the outward conformity. They are free to move forward in Christ. It's not a license to sin. It is a freedom to follow Christ. And the third thing is spiritual growth. If that is not happening in a person's life, then they need to ask, then it's probably for one of two reasons. It's either that they're quenching the Holy Spirit of God within. I mean, if, if, if they are obsessed with the external and drying up within, then something is wrong. Perhaps they have quenched the Holy Spirit. Maybe they're not surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Maybe, they, maybe they're harboring some sin, some wrong thing in their life, some, some wrong attitude. Somehow they have quenched perhaps the Holy Spirit of God. If, if they're not growing, then something is wrong. Perhaps the Holy Spirit of God has been quenched. Because when the Holy Spirit of God is controlling, there will be growth. Change from glory to glory. Or the second option would be this. Maybe they don't even have the Holy Spirit of God. And if that's the case, that means they're not even saved. Because a person who's saved has the Holy Spirit of God. Now if there's one here this morning that doesn't have the Holy Spirit of God living within, then what you need to do is to quit trying to be a Christian and you need to put your faith and trust in Christ for salvation and he will make you a Christian. <laughs> but if we are here and we are saved, are we living lives where the Holy Spirit has control, where we are yielded and surrendered, not harboring sin, not... Uh, I'm not talking about perfect people, folks. There is no such thing as a perfect Christian here on earth. But I'm talking about Christians who, boy, when they do mess up, they are quick to confess it, forsake it, get God's forgiveness on that thing, and move forward. And as best they know how, they're surrendering, and they're, they're allowing the Holy Spirit to have His way in their heart, and they're, they're feeding the things of the Spirit of God. Now, folks, when that happens, then the Holy Spirit controls. And there will be life and there will be liberty and there will be growth. But if that's not happening and, and we're truly a child of God, then it must mean that we're quenching the Holy Spirit. And I don't think any of us would recommend that. You know, sometimes I think Christians, well-meaning Christians, harbor things in their life and don't even realize that they are quenching the Holy Spirit of God. They have not set out to quench Him. They have not set out to hinder Him. They're just trying to sort of do what pleases them in, in some area. Or give in to carnality in some area. Or do their own thing in some area. And they're not even thinking that when they do that, and allow the sin to remain, or allow the carnality to grow, or whatever, that what they are doing is quenching the Holy Spirit. And when they quench the Holy Spirit of God, their Christian life will become a thing of putting on an outward appearance, even though internally they begin to dry up. And there really won't be liberty to move forward in Christ Jesus. It will be all about the list of rules to convince themselves and everyone else they're still a good Christian. And they'll stop growing and won't even know it. Because they'll look at their past and they'll see their pattern of growth in the past and they won't realize that their momentum has slowed down or stopped. And they never set out to quench the Holy Spirit, but they did. Now these three things ought to be true of the Spirit-controlled life. And they certainly were true of the Spirit ministry.
the Holy Spirit ministry that Paul had. I guess the question is, where are we with all this? Our Father, you know our hearts. You know every person in this room that is your child. You know our hearts. You know whether we're as imperfect as we are, whether we're allowing the Holy Spirit to control us.